Thank you. Yes, sorry, I have a, a, a very busy week, so I'm only with you for today, and that's why you've got a bit of a potpourri from me. So, as, as you can see from the title, because I think most of the screening is going to be tomorrow, so I'm going to just okay. give you a little feel for screening in the, in the UK at the moment. So, um, firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about this whole penetrant story, which you've heard about, um, and in particular concentrating on breast cancer, and it, it really is... Uh, a moving area at the moment with these panels identifying genetic variants that uh, appear to be less penetrant. And even within the core binding domain, missense mutations may actually be associated with much lower risks. And you've, uh, you've seen that uh, actually a, a, a variant associated with adrenocortical. We, we presented two variants, one in code on 152 and one in 158, which appear to be less penetrant, but are particularly high risk for adrenocortical. So a little bit similar to the, the Brazilian 337 mutation. So we have, uh, at the moment, in the Manchester cohort, 65 families with uh, P53 uh, uh, pathogenic variants. 42 of those are missense mutations, 194 mutation carriers, 120 of whom are female, so there is a testing bias there, and that may be partly due to breast cancer. 48 uh, carriers are currently unaffected. And that actually includes 14 with the code on 152, including four women over the age of uh, over the age of 55, so, and none of those women have actually developed breast cancer with that codon 152 uh, proline to leucine change. So this is uh, something I put together a few years ago, um, and I'll show you the penetrance curve later, showing that, that P53 is more penetrant at younger ages than BRCA, uh, and we really don't know a great deal about what happens after 50, to be honest. Um, there, there certainly do seem to be still breast cancers occurring, but uh, we just follow up so few women over the age of 50 uh, to know really what, what happens after that age. And again, this is likely to be... Uh, it, uh, likely to be an overestimate. If you look at some of the panel work uh, that's come out recently, P53 actually gets less uh, uh, odds ratios than some of the other high-risk genes like CDH1 and even PALB2. Um, but again, you just wonder about what variants are being called and how penetrant those variants are. So a lot of our breast work started off actually with a population-based study of breast cancer age 30 and under. And what we identified was women who developed breast cancer between 1980 and 1997. And I started this off in 1990. So uh, at the time I started it off, quite a lot of the women had already died. This is the current situation rather than when I first uh, 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 approached them. So when we first assessed it, there were still 166 living women. Um, a number of consultants refused contact with those women, but actually four have since come forward. In fact, actually six now have since come forward. And uh, there were also women who themselves refused, although subsequently some of those women have come forward as well. We now have actually 118 samples, and we've classified those as 67 sporadic, where there is no other breast or ovarian cancer in the family, 45 familial, and six of them met Lee Fraumini criteria uh, of some sort or another. And in that first purely population based uh, data set, although with some potential survival bi uh, bias, um, there were twice as many BRCA1 mutations as BRCA2, but actually P53 was almost as common as BRCA2, and in fact, BRC, uh, P53 in the sporadic cases was as common as both BRCA1 and BRCA2 put together, and in one of those, that was a proven de novo mutation in P53. Um, so when we look at the, the Lee Fraumini, Lee Fraumini-like, we found three out of six 
uh, with uh, P53 mutations. These are the three here. And one of the Lee family likes actually had a BRCA2 mutation uh, rather than P53. And in the sporadics, these are the two mutations here. One of them was inherited from the mother. And actually, I'm not 100% certain this is really a pathogenic variant. I think there is now evidence to suggest this might be dropping out. Uh, interestingly, in terms of the radiation exposure, this poor lady uh, developed uh, bilateral breast cancer and a renal cell carcinoma. And the, uh, the person who was following her up insisted on doing six monthly IVUs and she developed a sarcoma behind the remaining kidney. Now, that's maybe anecdotal, but uh, in the context of radiation and P53, I wouldn't recommend using such regular radiation imaging. So we've now expanded our, uh, expanded our data set to 305 breast cancers, age 30 and under. Uh, and this is still coming out at around a 6% detection rate for TP53, 14 out of 245. We are now analyzing this remaining 60 here to, to get everything up to 305. And what's coming out is the two types that are coming out, a high-grade comedo DCIS, which really is a signature tumour for P53. And the important thing is you can pick that up on MRI screening really well, and it's a cure because it's still pre-invasive. Uh, and the other is obviously HER2 positive, grade 3, usually triple positive breast cancer. Um, and at the moment... Uh, we're seeing about a 70 to 80% uh, detection rate. 16 out of 124 of the sporadics uh, had mutations in BRC1 and 2. Seven had them in uh, TP53. And there is a, a triple negative bias here. So that's, that's where the BRCA1s uh, are turning up. So in terms of contralateral risk, uh, we, we can expand our number with uh, P53, including non-pro bands, up to 28. Uh, and 11 of those have developed contralateral breast cancer, so a very high contralateral breast cancer rate. And where we have HER2 receptor status, as I said, 78% of the invasives were HER2 positive. And this is uh, work from the POSH study, which... Uh, uh, combined with us showed this, uh, this early study showing this high HER2 positive rate, uh, typically triple positive. So what is emerging is when we actually start looking in breast cancer, rather than in classical Lee-Framini syndrome, we start to see uh, variants which are not typical. So these are mainly splicing variants or nonsense mutations. In fact, this may, may be a splicing uh, variant as well, that are much further into the gene in exons 9 and 10. And these uh, show an almost breast familial breast cancer phenotype. Uh, but again, you can get your fingers burnt because one of our sarcomas we found in the whole body study, and she's now unfortunately passed away, uh, it was actually a sarcoma, a liposarcoma in the mediastinum. So uh, it's, you'd be in danger of saying, oh, there's just breast cancer in the family, don't worry about it. I think it starts to turn up that they do develop the other tumours. So when we look at the overall rate of contralateral breast cancer in the whole data set, it's about 6 per 1,000, 6% in a 10-year period. Uh, whereas if you look at uh, TP53, and this is, this is just the population set here, it, it comes out at about 3, uh, sorry, uh, at, at about... Um, uh, 60% in 20 years, uh, if you look at our, I haven't done the Kaplan-Myers yet, but that's uh, what it's looking like at the moment. So uh, a very high rate, about 3% for every year. So 30% uh, at 10 years, 60% at 20 years. So a very, very high rate indeed in these very early onset cases, probably because there are other modifiers that are increasing breast cancer risk. 
And this is not so dissimilar uh, from uh, the, the French work uh, that was published a few years ago in JCO, and again, a very similar uh, her higher rate of HER2 positivity. So from the breast cancer work, really I would say that, uh, that in the very early onset cases that, uh, that P53 is something that you really should be looking at, as reflected now in the, the, the modified Chompre criteria, and even if we take um, a one in a thousand germline pathogenic variant rate in the general population, which may, may be an overestimate, this is still a 60-fold relative risk of breast cancer under the age of 30 if we detect 6% with breast cancer. Because the population risk of breast cancer by 30 years of age is one in a thousand. So it's still an incredibly high rate of breast cancer, even if you take that rather high population uh, figure. And this is the penetrance curve using our family, you can see, uh, shooting up in the, tw in the 20s and 30s. Obviously, this may be exaggerated and certainly does not apply to all variants in P53, like the 15 2 variant, which clearly does not have this high risk. And of course, we did publish the original 1 in 5,000 uh, estimate based on our breast cancer work uh, in a population setting. And of course, that may be uh, now an underestimate of the rate of pathogenic variants. So moving on to the screening, uh, obviously until very recently, until in fact really the AACR guidelines, there really was no consensus on what to do. Uh, and so this is really pre that and when we set up the study in the UK. Um, but it was really the Toronto work that has uh, pushed things forward in terms of uh, at last identifying um, a screening protocol that appeared to be picking up uh, tumours very early. And I think there is a real feeling that uh, this is picking up things much earlier in the disease course. Perhaps the, the, the lower grade gliomas that have been picked up on these protocols reflects the fact that gliomas may actually go through grade drift. Uh, so you might pick them up at grade two, whereas if you wait symptomatically, actually they present as grade threes and fours. Uh, so um, really, Ros Eels drove this uh, with a, a whole body uh, MRI study uh, with uh, one centimeter cuts and no gadolinium enhancement. And uh, we recruited 42 uh, P53 carriers and 42 controls to that. But just to say that previously, we did identify two P53 carriers with breast cancer. In fact, they were both comedo, high-grade comedo DCIS on MRI, age 29 and 33. So uh, the, the whole body MRI would not be a good tool to detect early breast cancer. So you have to do dedicated MRI for the breast as well. So these were the aims of the, uh, uh, the, the Signify study. And because we had a control group, and I think we're pretty much the only study that had a control group, we had an idea of what we would pick up in people who were not at high risk of, of developing cancer and not P53 carriers. So these are the 44 in each group. And uh, the protocol, I'm not going to go into that in detail, except that they were read by two radiologists independently uh, and scored on a five-point scale and that obviously anything abnormal identified was taken through a protocol for further uh, evaluation. Uh, these are obviously age match controls, so everything pretty matched up, men and women matched up, uh, and obviously there were some previous cancers in the Lefram mini cohort, but they had to be five years on and potentially cured from those cancers. M many of those were actually breast cancers. And we identified six cancers, or six cancers were identified. Four of those were picked up on the, so two-thirds were picked up on the protocol. Uh, all were asymptomatic. And two participants had two simultaneous primary tumours detected. So uh, obviously a pretty high prevalence rate uh, overall, 
Um, one in seven had cancer effectively at the prevalence uh, point, but 9% actually had detected cancers at that stage. So, so as I said, very, very high rates. Uh, in terms of further investigations, there were quite a lot of further investigations, as you can see, see here. So these were the cancers, astrocytoma, myxosarcoma, chromophobe renal sarcoma, lyomar sarcoma, and EAML and an osteosarcoma, a mediastinal liposarcoma I've already mentioned, which was actually missed. There was a pericardial cyst on the initial scan that we didn't reinvestigate, and that was obviously being tickled up from behind by a liposarcoma because her second scan showed a, 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 a much a larger pericardial cyst, and then eventually we found the liposarcoma. So these are some of the images you can see here. These do look quite big, but they were asymptomatic. Uh, this is uh, the uh, angiomyolipomas here. This is an osteosarcoma here, uh, and this is the mediastinal uh, sarcoma that we didn't pick up initially. This is the pericardial cyst you can see here. Uh, and the myxosarcoma, again, was picked up uh, on, on these images. So in terms of the non-malignant findings, um, a, a just significantly higher rate in the, in the P53 carries at 34% compared to seven uh, controls, 15.9%. So more investigations were carried out um, for sort of odds, uh, odds and different sorts that we, we uh, unfortunately, that did involve quite a lot of radi extra radiation imaging, and this is a concern, certainly if we're starting to use CT uh, on a regular basis. But what's reassuring is once you get past the prevalence scan, we've now done nearly 100 incident scans, there is very, very little extra radiological testing after the prevalence point. So the prevalence picks up uh, the, the odd cysts and odd things here and there, but actually after, once you've got past that prevalence scan, very much less is going on. So, very high prevalence rate, and this is, is if anything, very reassuring, because it's telling us that when there is a high prevalence pickup in a screening program, uh, compared to what you'd expect on incidents, that shows you screening is probably working very well. And I think there is an argument that we're changing the course of what's happening here uh, by doing uh, this type of screening, albeit that this is a small study, but I think there is, uh, in the, in the, uh, the meta-analysis, evidence that that's the case. And obviously this is a two-centre study, but many centres referred patients to the study. And this is obviously the meta-analysis, which you, you will be aware of, from 13 different studies, 578 participants, and again, a pretty high prevalence of 7%, which suggests that uh, this is something that, that may well be disease-changing in the future. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, so just the, the, the summary points here. And uh, this wouldn't be possible without a lot of people. Uh, obviously, people in the past like Jill Birch and, uh, and obviously Ros Eels, who set things up at the Marsden. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gareth. You kept it right on time. Um, questions? Maria Isabel. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I have a question re regarding childhood cancers and yep. from any syndrome. I, I know you didn't touch bases with, on that on your talk. But, and we I didn't know, actually involve children in the whole body study. Yeah, so, so that's the whole point. I, I know we have some local and uh, national situations where we don't have the, the Ministry of Health who do, cannot support us. Yep. But um, my question is, in the UK, what is your counseling to families where uh, they have a germline TP53 mutation and they want to get their children tested and followed up? So I think it's all going to depend. We're, we're having a consensus meeting in July, um, and we're bringing all the experts together to decide what we are going to do. So which bits of the AACR guidelines are going to be adopted in the UK? 
And I have to say that looking at some of the comments, there, is, there are a lot of people, maybe because they don't have access to whole body MRI, who are very anti doing anything in childhood. And uh, I think that is going to drive what is going to be approved, because if there's no screening in childhood, we'll go back to the old situation of pushing the parents away and saying, don't test now, let them decide when they're old enough, because there is no benefit from testing. Clearly, if you're going to be offering screening from birth, it, it takes away the decision completely. Then you have to say, well, you have to test at birth because you shouldn't be doing this screening on people who don't, on babies that don't carry the mutation. So it is all going to be dependent on what the UK group decision is as to what, what elements of the, of the AACR guidelines that we take up. And I, I think there is a real possibility Obviously, I'll be driving for screening, but there'll be a real possibility that the UK will actually not agree with the guidelines. Wow. All right. In the interest of but time... But not if I can help it. <laughs> in, the, in, in the interest of time, we do need to move forward. Okay. Uh, there you go. So just taking the chair's prerogative over that interest of time, if you need the pediatric oncology folks like uh, us across in London, we'll come. Because it's, it's ridiculous. You can't, we are there to help you, uh, Gareth. And, uh, and I know myself and uh, uh, Sharon and Anita and, and others who are in the pediatric space can definitely make a trip across the ocean. Thank you, David. That's really helpful. And the Great Ormond Street have implemented the protocol. So it is happening in the UK, but they're the only place at the moment. All right. Thank Gareth you. leaves, Jeff. Uh, Judy. Oh, Gareth, I just wondered, given your data in this population, are you recommending bilateral mastectomies at diagnosis to the? Um, well, we, uh, we we certainly would try and avoid, particularly in very young women doing radiotherapy. So I, I think we, I would, I would be telling women there is an extremely high rate of contralateral breast cancer and that they should seriously consider it. I would never actually say you have to do it, but, but yes, there, there is a sort of push in that direction. Okay. 